You call yourself one of the founding fathers of the European Citizens Initiative. So far there have been 55 European Citizens Initiatives, yet only three have been successful. And you have been working for this project for 20 years. How do you keep your good spirits? How do you continue working? Well, I think we have to see the European Citizens Initiative in a larger context. I think our generation's biggest challenge is to reconcile a globalized transnational economy with democracy. And the European Union, in the best case, is potentially a possibility to transnationalize democracy exactly in order to answer this globalized economy and to make our day-to-day -day life shapeable with democ democratic tools. And here, um, the European Citizens Initiative comes as the very first and only element of transnational participatory and digital democracy. And having this in mind uh, and this existential need to improve democracy now, I think it's very worth to invest uh, even further 20 years if needed. And uh, secondly, um, I can report about wonderful stories working with concrete European Citizens Initiatives, also those which do not succeed to collect a million signatures. I mean, uh, these people are our heroes. They take the initiative to change Europe. They take the initiative and use the European Citizens Initiative and we give them advice, legal advice, campaigning advice. We provide online campaigning um, software to collect signatures and so on and so on. So this is a, this are wonderful people to work with. And maybe one last point, I mean, as you said, I've been involved in the initial phase in the Constitutional Convention 2002 and 3, and I've made the personal experience that you can convince decision makers, you can make a change because we succeeded to campaign um, for the successful inclusion of the European Citizens Initiative into primary law. This was not an easy game. The ECI did not fall from heaven, but was a collective effort to do together and this success story still inspires me until today. Yeah, I can feel a lot of enthusiasm that drives you. Um, though looking at the European Union today, it's not in its best shape. You know, we have had to witness the first country leaving uh, uh, the European Union, Great Britain. There is a lot of uh, austerity, financial crisis right. and so on. So, um, and the European Citizens Initiative is one um, example of democracy or one tool. How do you embed the European Citizens Initiative into the wider context of transnational democracy that you had mentioned earlier on? Well, first of all, you are fully right. We are, as President Juncker said three, four weeks ago, in an existential crisis of the European Union. And in this context, we also observe um, the Euro European Ombudsman saying that the European Citizens Initiative is in an existential crisis. And uh, improving the ECI could help as a first step to further democratize the European Union. But to embed it in a larger context, I would love to see the European Union also as a tool to initiate a process for the entire reform and relaunch of the European project. We would need to discuss a bit deeper why this is so much needed, but I think the fear and distrust of decision makers towards um, citizens and participation increases even their anger and their your skepticism. And uh, we are in this vicious cycle which and a dangerous trap which we need to overcome now. And I think the best, the best idea would be if we as citizens unite together to start and initiate a process to relaunch and constitute Europe the way we want. Yeah, that would be my question because the European Commission uh, four weeks ago launched the work program for 2017. Yeah. And in this work program, there's, we can read very little about the European Citizens Initiative. They do not plan a revision. At the same time, as you mentioned, Juncker speaks about this existential crisis. Can you understand politicians why they do not do more for European democracy at this crucial stage? Well, they are fear-driven, well, and we have they are in this angst, as we say in German, and angst means they are narrowed in a certain perspective, narrow-minded. 
because of this um, existential fear. This is to a certain degree understandable. Animals and human beings react either by yeah, re escaping or by getting aggressive. But we need to calm down the debate and become rational again and see that this vicious cycle of distrust to our citizens can only overcome if we develop new tools of citizen participation, not by rejecting them. And in fact, the European Commission did not only um, refuse to implement ECI reform in the working program, but they explicitly said seven, eight months ago that the European Citizens Initiative is a threat to the European project. And this reflects again this, this fear towards citizens, which is not understandable to my degree, to, from my perspective, but um, we, we need to come in a conversation and um, otherwise we run the risk that we, that we lose democracy because if we don't update it now, we will run the risk to destroy democracy. So you're a person who dearly wishes to have transnational democracy in order to save Europe as a project of different nations working together and overcoming their nationalism, which so sadly we have to see strengthening these days. Do I understand you correctly? Yeah, I mean, I would not go so far to abolish the member states or the nation states. They are a constituting element of the European project. and. Um, uh, so this is not nationalism. I think nationalism is now what we observe among many populist movements as the solution to the problems of globalization. That you could, like the, the illusion that you could solve the problems mm -hmm. if you re-thrive or if you return exclusively to the member state. This is indeed dangerous, but I think member states and national entities should have a Con should continue to have an important role, but not such, such a dominant role as it has right now. Right now, member states meet in the council. Uh, it's a black hole in, in a very intransparent way. And uh, every member state wants to maximize its own interest. Mm. But the maximization of 28 um, member states does not result into the common European interest. And that's where the clash is in thinking and practice. And for this, we need to, as you say, complement this system with new transnational forms of democracy. As I understand, we, uh, or we just have to do it, yeah, to say, because if you don't democratize it, there will be this vicious circuit that you mentioned earlier on that, that just winds down. And um, so still the uh, situation is very complicated so you're you earlier on you said you're very active and person who still continues working what will you do exactly as the next steps well the first step now is of course to reform the european citizens initiative because the institutions are obliged to review the application of the implementing regulation of the european citizens initiative every three years the first review was 2015 the next one is an 18 month in 2018 and they are obliged to interact with us who make use of this instrument and who are in the field active. Um, but as I touched already in the beginning, I think to fundamentally, and I think this crisis touches the fundamental questions, how we or how the European project reclaims its promise for, for, for peace, for solidarity and democracy, this is in question right now. And um, how can we ensure that we create a Europe of, by and with the citizens, to, to quote this Lincoln uh, uh, quote and apply to the European project. There, there, there are these fundamental questions that need to be addressed in a fundamental debate and need to be turned and flow into a fundamental document. So is this a constitution? You this could be a constitution. Maybe the term constitution is not appropriate for the European project, we need to find out. Uh, for me, this also does not imply to have a United States of Europe. I think the, we need a very decentralized form for Europe. But indeed, we need to think about how do we want to constitute ourselves in Europe. And for this, we need to take and devote the sufficient time to discuss this. And uh, as I said, heads of states do not have any promising vision and idea. They are driven by fear, they are afraid of citizens and distrust them, and they also know if they want to change the way the European Union is being governed, they have to change primary law. And in order to change primary law, you have to change 
the treaties, and this requires the principle of unanimity, that means every 28 single member states have to agree, and at least in one of these, or several of these member states, we will have citizens' votes again, and that's sort of through referenda. And that's what heads of states want to avoid by all means. I've been working here for many years in Brussels, and the question of citizens' participation through referenda is like a don't talk about mm. issue, they are afraid exactly of this, but this brings them into this, and brings us, into this um, deadlocked situation. Yes. We cannot innovate, we cannot update democracy because of this fear, because of this distrust, because also of the missing mechanisms to, to, to improve European democracy. Yeah, so as I understand you, progress or continuing is the only solution, yet every peop all people need to participate in this project. How do you convince a person living in Lithuania to take part uh, far away, not understanding necessarily English that well. How do you do it? I mean, I, th I think not everyone has to participate, but everyone has to have the possibility to participate. That's a slight difference. And talking about Lithuania, one of our members is from Lithuania. She told me her father earns 600 euros a month. And democracy also means to have similar or equal life chances. This is part of democracy. If we don't have similar life chances, we have to make this a topic also for the people in Lithuania, also for the people in Greece, also for the people in Portugal and all the crisis hit countries. So um, we, we, we need to extend the debate in this constitutional assembly beyond institutional reform. If this is just an administrative reform, we can forget about receiving the support of the citizens in the end. I think we need a process where it is clear from the start that in the end the citizens will vote on this. What, and we have to learn from the past and the last constitutional convention 10 years ago, 2002-2003, when we had a 400 pages long document which was sent to every single household in France and fully over flooded and overburdened the people to understand the document within a few weeks and this led to a no vote. And here again we are driven or we were facing this fear driven reaction. What the heads of states instead did, they produced the Lisbon Treaty, which is 95% of the old constitutional mm -hmm. treaty, as you know, and passed it without uh, of the citizens' consent, only through parliament. And this again increases the citizens' yeah. uh, distrust. This is the part of this vicious circle. And um, so, so we cannot expect probably too much from heads of states. So it's up to us as civil society to step in and make our own proposals on the one hand for the process, how to get out and be on the substance content. And this means democracy itself, but also social questions and the euro itself. I just had a meeting with Joseph Stieglitz who says the euro is a failure and will fail if we don't fundamentally improve it because it only gives advantages to the very rich states. We have a huge gap between the north and the south of Europe. We have a huge gap between the rich and the poor people within the member states. And if you look at Brexit, the people who voted no or to, to leave the European Union are those who, have, who are the losers in the process of globalization and the process of the European Union. And so, so this is a key question. How do we get involved these people I don't have the solutions, but um, I think we need to discuss with them. So you have been working on making the EU more democratic for 20 years. So you already have a good feeling for time. And my question is, my last question, um, how many years do you still think it will take time to make the European Union more democratic or that it comes very close to your dream you're dreaming of? And uh, how will the European Union look like, in fact, at the end? Well, one option, one preferable option I see is that this crisis will, even if it continues to wire, to intensify, that it will finally help us to transform this crisis into a fundamental relaunch of the European project. And this could happen within the 10 years. I think probably before the next Parliament's elections of the European Parliament, we will not see an, an immediate change. But um, I think from 2019 on we can go into this process and we should take the sufficient time of four or five years to really start this constitutional assembly process. And then by 2030 I think we could really have a fundamentally recreated Europe that is not only top-down driven but also bottom-up. Very good, thank you. Welcome.